welcome to part two of this special videos I'm doing on a particular question that was asked me concerning what and how is the difference about the Aramaic text from any other translation of the Bible. And I left you with one that was so important uh, in video number one. This is video number two. And the one I'm answering is the words of Jesus on the cross on that very day that we call Good Friday. And in the ancient Near East, they don't call it Good Friday. They call it Suffering Friday, not Good Friday. And the words of Jesus on the cross. And I'm going to read to you from the King James Version in the Gospel of Matthew. This is the King James Version from the Greek text. And what Jesus says there in the 27th chapter and in the 45th and 46th verses. Listen carefully because I'm going to make a comparison. Now, verse 45. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, and I'm going to read through it the way they write out the Aramaic here. Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was Jesus forsaken on the cross when he was doing God's will? How is that? Let me read to you Dr. Lamson's translation. This is the Holy Bible from the ancient Eastern Aramaic text. And you need to see video number one, what I said about this text and what the Church of the East says about it. All right. Again, Matthew 27, verse 45. Now, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, El, I'm pronouncing now exactly the way it was in the Aramaic. El, El, Mana, Shwakthan. My God, my God, for this I was spared. What? Not, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, for this I was spared. And then Dr. Lamza has a footnote. He can also be translated, my God, my God, this was my destiny. Not, why have you forsaken me? And I know every Easter, when they do the Holy Week of Jesus, and they talk about Good Friday, they try to explain why God forsook Jesus when he was dying on the cross. Well, according to the Aramaic text, he was not forsaken or abandoned. The word, let me tell you the word. In Aramaic, as I said, it's El El Lamana. Lamana means, means for what or to what, for what or to what. I'm saying T-O-W-H-A-T, to what or for what. It can be a question or it can be a statement. This word Lamana, the L in front of the word mana, mana means what. The L is a preposition and it means two or four hmm? and it's always translated with for what and then you have left me hmm? but it's really to what okay now not why lamana can can mean why too it depends on the context and this is that this is why in the greek they left it in there that is to say that they put the Aramaic in there. Why did they put the Aramaic in there? 
because they weren't sure of the translation. That's why the next phrase that follows in the Greek is, that is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because they weren't too sure about the translation into the Greek. So let's look at the Aramaic again some more. Literally it says, El, El, which is, oh God, oh God. El was, or El, either way you want to say it, El or El. El is Aramaic pronunciation spelled the same way, an Aleph and a Lamed, an A and an L. And, or you're going to pronounce it in the Hebrew just El. El, but it's still the the Aramaic, the Hebrew word is still an alep, and the Aramaic word is still an alep and an l, which is we say as God. Then mana to what? Now here's the difference. It's in that word shabak shawak shwakten shwakten. The b is soft. It's not shabaktani. Not Shabbatani, as most people pronounce it, but it's Shwakthan. And it's from the root word S H B Q. S H B Q. Some use a K there, but they use a Q to differentiate it from another letter that is also a K in Aramaic. And they use a Q here. So it's Shwakthan. The root is S H. B, but the B is soft and becomes a W or a V sound. And then the final letter, which is a Q, or you can say K if you want to. And that, that root of the word has many meanings, so it depends on the context. It means to forgive. The word schwak means to forgive. It means to pardon. It means to untie. It means to let loose. It has all these different expressions in the Aramaic language. So if you're going to be very literal, very literal, el, el, man, shwakten, le, man, shwakten, it means, oh God, oh God, to what an end, to what a purpose you have kept me. That's why Dr. Lemza in a footnote says, this was my destiny. Not, why have you forsaken me? And he was not quoting the 22nd Psalm, as most people put it. And, or they will also tell you that so much, all the sins of the world was laid on Jesus and God couldn't look at it. <laughs> God couldn't look at his son. No, 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 no. Jesus told his apostles, you will forsake me. It was earlier, before he went to the cross, before he was being tried. He said, you will forsake me, but my father is always with me. Mm -hmm. And yet here on the cross, he's saying, why, why have you forsaken me? He's not doing such a thing. He's saying, my God, my God, this was my destiny. To what an end you have kept me. It's literally what it is. To what a purpose you have kept me. To fulfill a destiny. And the cross was a tremendous destiny. He was going to show that human beings have power over sin, over death, over death. Hmm? He's giving death a new meaning, a new synthesis, a brand new understanding. This is what he was saying. And this is why the Aramaic is so clear on this. Very clear. Not why have you abandoned me. Why have you let me lose? In, if you want to say abandon, you have to use two other kinds of Aramaic words. Nashatan, or a, another word that they use. But this is not what was used. It was shwak is what they use. Shwaktan. And this is the meaning of it from the Aramaic text. In my book that Dr. Lambs and I worked on together, his commentaries, the one he had already written, but I added more to it, and so did he. And that's the set that you see right here beside me. He goes into detail, much more detail, page after page after page, explaining 
that cry of Jesus on the cross, not meaning why have you forsaken me? And I didn't want to get into that because this is just a short video to give you a quick overview of what the Aramaic has to present to us. Then you have in the Lord's Prayer, again in Matthew, the ninth chapter, I mean, the, <laughs> not the ninth chapter, it begins with the ninth, <clears throat> ninth verse in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew. And in the chapter there, it's chapter six, beginning with the ninth verse. Let me go to it. Chapter six, beginning with the ninth verse. And he says here, therefore pray in this manner, our father in heaven, you know, we know the Lord's prayer. And then where it says, and do, you know, most of us read it and do not let, do not lead us into temptation. You're telling God, asking God, please don't lead me into temptation. Don't lead any of us into temptation. Don't, 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 don't tempt us. How is that possible? Can God lead you into temptation? Does God want to lead you into temptation to see what you will do? No way. That's not how God does things. That's how we think about it, but not God. James, in his epistle, in this very New Testament, regardless of what Bible you have, it says, let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For God tempts no one or no man, this would literally what it says, but no one, literally in the Aramaic, no one, God tempts no one. He doesn't need to try you out. He knows what's in you. And so that's what the Aramaic text, it clarifies that. So in the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus said is, la tatlan litnisiona, litnisiona which is, and do not let us enter into temptation. In other words, keep me out of trouble. Don't let me enter into temptation because I'm the one that gets tempted my, for my own thoughts, for my own desires, and for my own wants. And what you're praying is, and do not let us enter into temptation. Keep me out of trouble. That's exactly what the prayer is saying not the other way around. So again, now we only have two. Now I gave you two in, in the first video. I gave you two now, but there is more. There is a great deal more. Let me, I'll just give you two more and then I will continue this again. Isaiah 43 verse 28. Therefore, says the King James Version and so do all the other ones. I have profound the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to the reproaches. God saying that he has profaned the princes of the sanctuary. That's what it's implying. But the Aramaic says, your princes have defiled the holy place that is the sanctuary. Therefore, I have given Jacob to the curse and Israel to the shame. In other words, God didn't stop it. He, okay, that you want to profane the holy place, the temple, the sanctuary? Have at it. God didn't stop it is what Isaiah is saying. Your princes is the one that got that idea. And they did unholy things in that sanctuary. Then again, in Jeremiah 40. Jeremiah 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 10. Then said I, O Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying, Ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reaches into the soul. That's terrible. The Aramaic text says, then I said, I implore you, O Lord God, truly, I have deceived this people in Jerusalem exceedingly because I have said, you will have peace. And instead, the slain sword reaches as far as the soul. In other words, he missed it in the meaning here. Jeremiah is blaming himself. I, I, 
When I told the people that they would have peace and they didn't have peace, it brought the sword. Mm. Not, O oh Lord God, thou has greatly deceived this people. God doesn't practice deception. But according to this, and I'll never forget arguing with a minister. He was arguing. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Jeremiah was correct. God is the one who deceived. I couldn't believe this minister was telling me that. Huh? Okay, I've given you two more. So there's four verses alone. There are about 12,000 differences between the Aramaic text coming into English. And remember what I told you, the problem is our translations, not the Bible itself. It's a misunderstanding of Semitic words, meanings, culture, and background that has created the problem. And there's another one that people have often wondered about. And that is where God says, I am a jealous God. And he, he tells the people that I am a jealous God. Is God jealous? Well, in video number three, we'll go into some more differences and then some expressions in Aramaic that people misunderstood. Like when Paul says in his letters and he commands the church and tells them, turn them over to Satan, give them to Satan. <laughs> what? Paul's telling them to give the people, the, some of the members of the church, give them to Satan? What is, what is that? That is not a mistranslation, but it's something else. What? What could that possibly mean? Well, stand by for video number three.